Let's take some time now to um, have a look at what was happening in the UK um, during this period uh, leading up to the British invasion here in this country, that is in the United States in 1964. Remember that uh, at the beginning of the course, I, I emphasized that the history that we're telling of the history of rock in this class is really one that is markedly and almost exclusively really from the, from the American perspective. But this is going to be one of those moments where we try to look at what the history of rock looked like, not from America, but from the UK. And it turns out that um, in many ways, the history of rock looks quite different from a UK perspective. Some of the, those of you who are, who are taking the course from the UK can comment on that. Um, and uh, so we shouldn't assume that simply because we're talking about a lot of the same artists that the situation is the same. And maybe sometimes it's similarity that, that, that blinds us to some important and significant differences. So here's what was happening in the UK in the period of the late 50s and the early uh, 1960s. When you look at the UK charts up to 1963, it's pretty clear that US pop dominates the UK charts. That is, if you look at for the year 1961, 1962, what the top singles are uh, for that year in the US, and then you look at the charts in the UK, you'll find a lot of those same records. More records by American artists, artists out of the US, than by artists from the UK. And even those artists from the UK, in many ways, uh, mostly imitated American artists. Um, and the attitude, I think, of a lot of British musicians was that their music was maybe not as good as American music, but at least it was homegrown. Certainly the attitude in America, and we'll talk about this uh, pretty soon, is the idea that, um, it cer certainly was the attitude in America that UK music wasn't as good as American uh, music. And the Beatles, of course, and the Stones, they change all that. But for right now, I want to focus on the fact that even among the Brits, they thought that their own music was probably not as good as American music. Ever going back to the Second World War, when there was a, a lot of American presence in the UK, we brought our pop music with us. Uh, the the uh, British people sort of uh, became fans of American popular music, and so popular music for them uh, was um, the, the best popular music was the music from the US. Those that imitated uh, American artists, uh, there were a lot of them, uh, mostly imitating, in many ways, Elvis Presley. Probably the most important in the UK is Cliff Richard. Cliff Richard, in the period between 1958 and 1963, had 27 hit singles in the UK. Cliff Richard had a very difficult time getting any kind of real chart action in this country, but in the UK he was like an Elvis. I mean one hit after another he was a very very big star. There was also a, a, a UK um, version of the Teen Idols. There was a fella, we, we talked in, in uh, last week about uh, Bob Marcucci in Philadelphia being a guy who groomed a lot of young teen idols. Where, well, in the UK, the guy who did this was a fella named Larry Parnes. And uh, he managed a, a, a bunch of teen idols. He had a kind of whole stable of these guys, uh, including Tommy Steele, Marty Wilde, and Billy Fury. You can tell from all these stage names that there's something aggressive and exciting about these acts. And they, these guys had single, hit single after hit single. Uh, these were all records that essentially invisible to Americans because they never saw any of this. Uh, it was part of the UK scene. And so looking at this period from the UK side, you have to factor in all this kind of thing. This is the situation that the Beatles and the Stones and the rest of these groups, when they were making it in their own country, uh, came upon. Of records that crossed over the Atlantic and became hits in the early 1960s. Uh, the only two that, that are really in, uh, were really, really successful was um, a, a record called Telstar, uh, an instrumental record called Telstar by the Tornadoes, went to number one both in the uh, US and the UK in 1962. Uh, the Tornadoes, it turns out, were the backing band uh, for Billy Fury. It turns out that Cliff Richard also had a backing band. They were called The Shadows, and The Shadows had a whole series of hits in the UK. Well, this backing band, The Tornadoes, had this uh, this international or um, U.S. American hit, uh, Telstar. Interestingly, produced and written um, by the legendary British producer Joe Meek, who in many ways is kind of... Um, the, the parallel to Phil Spector uh, for British music there, although I think Phil Spector probably had a greater success rate in this country than Joe Meek had in the UK. Still, he's an important early independent producer. Um, 
In the UK also, there was a very different structure of how record labels and radios worked. And this, this really created a very different picture in a lot of kinds of ways. In this country, we talked about the growth of regional radio and how there were, you know, music on the radio, a bunch of different stations all the time in this country, and that left room for, for stations to be able to specialize in rhythm and blues or country and western or mainstream pop or whatever. Um, and of course we had lots and lots of record labels. It was really important that we had independent labels. We talked last time about, in, in the time before that, about how important independent labels were in being able to sort of bring rock and roll uh, to people. But it turns out that in the UK it wasn't so much like that. Uh, they had the BBC uh, because in many ways uh, the, the, the UK had decided that when they decided to license radio they were going to keep it within the, the auspices of the government itself and so there were no stations in addition to the BBC that you could tune into. You had as, much as, as many as three different state uh, three different flavors of BBC, but that was about it. Uh, there was a, a station called Radio Luxembourg uh, that was broadcasting uh, from the continent. There was pirate radio ships out in the um, uh, out out in the uh, uh, sea who were who were broadcasting back. And the problem, of course, with the, something like Radio Luxembourg was that the programming was paid for by the record labels. Uh, in terms of record labels, there were very few independent labels uh, in the UK. It was a very, very difficult road, uh, much smaller market, very much dominated by the major labels. And when you haven't got a lot of radio to get your music to people, um, and when you have a limited number of uh, record stores, I mean, uh, the population being smaller, a lot of record owners weren't really interested in getting records from independent labels. They already had plenty of product from the major labels. It made it very difficult to really, to, to keep a, an independent label afloat. So that meant that a lot more of what the Brits heard in terms of, of rock and roll were the things that came to them through these sort of sanctioned uh, sources, uh, the BBC, the major labels, and so that really constrained strained uh, what was available. I would say there's probably less variety available there than there was in this country. However, the variety there was uh, different from the one we had here because they had all the British artists uh, that we were talking about as well. An important early movement in, uh, in British pop, or a, a movement that's important to us for, uh, in terms of talking about the, the 60s, uh, is a movement called Skiffle. It was led by a fella, uh, Lonnie Donegan, uh, who had uh, played, was a member of a big band, we'll talk about trad jazz in just a minute, but uh, uh, was basically adapted American folk music with a bit of a kind of big band kind of beat or sort of a heavier beat with the, the use of the drums, although sometimes uh, he would use a washboard in uh, a traditional kind of way. But anyway, um, his Rock Island Line, which is a traditional song, uh, was number eight in the UK and even made number eight over here uh, in, the, in the US in 1956. And that kind of launched in the UK uh, what's often called a skiffle craze. And that meant kids all across the UK were getting inexpensive acoustic guitars and learning the, the first position chords, the G's, the C's, the D's, the A minors, the E minors, and learning to play these skiffle tunes, which were essentially versions of American traditional folk music. All of this happens before the folk revival that happened in America, which we can trace back to 58 or 59. They were doing skiffle already in 56 and 57. But this idea of strumming chords, uh, easy tunes that anybody can do, was extremely influential on, on the members of the Beatles, uh, the Rolling Stones. Jimmy Page, in fact, uh, there's a television clip that, uh, that you can find where Jimmy Page, as just a young teenage kid, appears on a variety show as a skiffle musician doing skiffle music. And so the skiffle thing, very, very important. We'll see Trace of it uh, in the Beatles music uh, when we look at their music in 63, 64, and 65. Other kinds of things that were happening in the UK at that time, there was a real interest in what they called trad jazz. In the UK, trad jazz is more like, less like big band jazz in a sense, less like uh, bebop for sure, more like Dixieland kind of jazz, really old New Orleans uh, kind of jazz is really the, what, what, what trad jazz uh, tended to sound like a lot of the time. Uh, some of the uh, important uh, artists there in the UK doing trad jazz were Ken Collier, Chris Barber, uh, Kenny Ball, and Acker Bilk. Acker Bilk actually had another, there were, there were two 
uh, uh, British hits that, that, that uh, went to number one in our country before 1964. One of them I already talked about, Telstar. The second one was a song called Stranger on a Shore by the Acker Built Orchestra in 1962, also went to number one. So when we say the Beatles broke through and had a whole series of number one hits, it's not like they're the first UK band to have done it, but certainly there was a lot more of it happening and it was uh, a lot more consistent. Anyway, uh, so that gives you a little sense of the, of the trad jazz scene. And also there was a movement in the UK, not a lot of records on the chart to be sure, of blues revivalists and those were people like Cyril Davies, Alexis Corner and John Mayhall. That'll be important to us in a little bit when we talk about the roots of the Rolling Stones and some of the other Stones type groups like the Yardbirds and, and, and the Animals and others like that. The idea there was they had a real fascination for uh, American blues music and really worked to imitate it. So when you think about it we're talking about skiffle, trad jazz, blues revivalists, these were all folks who perhaps because they were enamored by the Americans uh, when they came over during the Second World War were really fascinated by what we might call the more vernacular musics uh, uh, in American culture. And so um, you get this fascination by sometimes you know very educated and, and, and sophisticated middle-class people in some of the music that's most associated with the the, the poorest and most underprivileged elements of American culture. Uh, it's a fascinating phenomenon. We don't really have time to pursue it in a kind of sociological sense here, but it's worth noting because it's the root of, of what traditional music meant to a lot of the British musicians that we're going to be talking about. So having given you kind of a, a snapshot of what things looked like in the UK leading up to 1963, let's now turn our attention to the rise of the Beatles.